Okay, so good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the first JavaScript Live webinar. This is a part of the live series webinars that we're hosting here at Amicus Recruitment. Um, my name is Jamie Crowley. If you haven't heard of myself or Amicus before, we're a specialist technical recruitment agency specializing within JavaScript, Python, and Golang across London and Berlin. So today we're joined by a leader within the JavaScript market, Tom Reddington, who will be giving us a talk on microservice architecture and more specifically how it can be used in client-side software. So the session is aimed to be interactive. There is a Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. So feel free to ask as many questions as you want um, as we go through the webinar and myself and Tom will take regular breaks to make sure they get answered. Um, enough from me though anyway, Tom, how are you today? Very well, thank you. And yourself? Yeah, very well, thank you, very well. Um, so I've given you a bit of a brief introduction there, but why don't you tell everyone a little bit more about yourself and, and what exactly we'll be talking about today. Cool, great. Um, so my name's Tom. Um, I work for a company called Headbox and we are a startup in the event tech space. So we're looking to uh, kind of reinvent that industry using what we like to talk about as humankind event tech. So that's a bit about kind of, you know, the kind of emotional intelligence that, that a person can bring and the kind of artificial intelligence that software can bring as well. And we're trying to bring those two beautiful things together to, to at this time, I'm sure everyone's craving a little bit more. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about micro front ends. So I'm going to share my screen now. Yep, feel free. Give this little uh, presentation up and running. Cool. So um, what we're going to talk about is microservice architecture in client side software. But before we do that, I just want to roll things back a little bit and ask you to uh, picture the scene. You're a new business, maybe a startup. You've got this awesome idea, but you know, limited funds, limited people. You've got to prove your business model is gonna work quickly and simply, or it's gonna fail. What do you do? Well, you, you build one of these, don't you? And for those of you who haven't seen 2001 A Space Odyssey, that's a monolith. And, you know, they get a real hard time, but, you know, the monolith, it's good at lots of things, you know, with a simple, main, well-maintained code base deployed as, you know, a single tier software application, you can be good at lots of things and you can do it pretty fast. You might say it's not perfect, but it gets the job done until it doesn't. So, you know, there's, there's a problem there in, in many cases and, you know, it's hard to scale. It can become increasingly difficult to change things as the code base grows through complexity and, and just kind of the, the, great, the great kind of mass that is, is that code base. Um, you can't really be great at everything. You become a bit of a jack of all trades and master of none. You know, your software is good at doing lots of things quite well, but it gets really hard to specialize and, and do a specific thing well, such as, you know, data processing or machine learning or, you know, having the most interactive uh, client side experience you can. It also takes forever to release as it grows and you kind of get banished to this deployment hell. In essence, your devs start to do this a lot. So that's where we bring in microservices usually. And the reason why we might do that is that the deployments are independent, which makes them quick and less risk risky. They are technology agnostic. So, you know, you have the freedom to solve things in the best possible way. That really kind of starts to deal with this whole jack of all, master of none problem. They're discreet and focused on doing one thing really, really well. Kind of the same deal, right? And they create autonomy for your software, but also for your teams who produce them. And that's the real big key thing there, autonomous. Autonomous teams producing software autonomously, you know, people get more ownership, you get better engaged developers producing better quality software with better results. It's pretty awesome, but there is a disclaimer. Microservices are not a silver bullet, and sometimes, you know, that well-structured monolith can be perfectly fine. So they were conceived to solve a specific set of problems. And if you don't have them, maybe don't use microservices. But the point is that I'm going to assume for the purpose of this that we all understand the benefits of microservices and why we might want to use them. And it's not just because it's cool. So with that out of the way, let's talk a little bit about micro front ends. You know, what the hell are they? 
Well, in essence, micro front ends are the extension of microservice concepts to the client side. So you might be thinking like, what the fuck? Well, it's literally that, right? It's a nice little diagram of micro front ends applied to that beautiful microservice picture we saw before. And it's exactly the same. Got independent deployments now. Each of those front ends can go out in their own life cycle when they're ready, when the team is ready to put some work out. They're now technology agnostic. And I don't mean, you know, write a React app for one and an Angular app for the other, but it does give you the scope to, you know, use different sets of dependencies where it's appropriate and really strip things back as much as anything where you, you don't need to have that, that full kind of SBA going on. Again, they're now discrete and specialized. You know, each of those front ends has a specific job to do and we can really focus on honing them to be really, really great at doing it. And again, the most important thing is they're autonomous. If you have a larger scale organization, you can have different teams owning their own sections of the infrastructure, deploying them, building them, testing them, iterating on them in, in uh, autonomous ways, which don't involve this great big kind of mega release of, of the kind of front end monolith. So, you know, cool story. What's the benefits of microservices? Well, we kind of talked about them. So that's the talk over in a way, but actually what I thought would be more interesting to do is talk about how we can apply this to front ends in a kind of front end specific way or, or kind of like this three for this purpose, client side problems that microservices can help with. So the first one that we found is that, you know, there's this issue of like a really high cognitive overhead and quite a low battery life for your machine when you're working across the board with everything. So sort of imagine this, you're the new dev at a company, you've been asked to pick up a small task to help you get to grips with the organization's process in the stack. You know, it's probably something like this. Update feature X with new design Y. Cool, great, amazing. But there's the, oh, by the way, you'll also need to run Rails backend locally, install it, dump, blah, 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 blah. You start screaming. It's like, I've now got a small task which is going to take me three days to do. I can't do it off the mains power because my laptop will run out and it's just a massive pain. So... You know, what we found with microservices in the front end is that a developer is empowered to do their work with minimal friction and as few local dependencies as possible. In fact, at Headbox, if you want to work on one of our microservice front ends now, they're lightweight, they're decoupled from any services they consume. We just point them to a pre-prod stage of whatever they need and they go. It's Git clone jump into your project and then you just run your yarn commands and off you are going. Like there's nothing else you need to do. And that's really, really nice if you want to get people on something really quickly or up to speed really quickly. So it's, it's a really nice benefit, which, um, you know, we found to be mass massively useful. Another thing you might come to is the kind of user permission spaghetti issue. So you've got your big old monolithic front end and you have to hold a lot of business logic in one place. You know, if user A, hide feature B. If user X, but not Y, allows that action. When you have different types of user, you need to make sure that they can do everything they need to do, but you also need to make sure that they can't do anything they shouldn't. And with the SBA kind of situation, your monolithic front end, it's the perfect breeding ground for bugs and it can get messy really, really quickly. And you end up with permissions conflict, you end up with a defect you end up triaging and, and rolling back a load of stuff. So um, before you know it, you look like kind of 90s Justin Timberlake in your software with all the if statements. It's just, it's just not cool. So we, we've kind of come to the idea that each micro front end is a user center projection over a common data to apply business logic. And um, here's an example of that. Um, we put this to practice in one of our software solutions which we call the lead feed in the lead feed we match people who want to hold an event with venues that can host them our common data source in this case is the lead which is a set of guest requirements for an event for example in the host experience the user can request access to the lead feed but in the administrator experience they can then grant access to that user set the terms such as contract length or in the host experience, a user can send a message indicating that they can host an event. And we then have a kind of mirrored guest experience as a separate interface where the user can review these messages and choose venues to move forward with. So 
it really comes down to making things simple and actually you know in our front ends now we only ask one question which is are you who i'm expecting yes or no another big issue with the kind of monolith front ends is that uh, you know you get this release test fail rollback repeat cycle and the builds get slower and slower over time it can be really easy to change it, something in a single place which breaks something in another that you weren't even looking at unforeseen bugs become commonplace particularly presentational ones you know that whole cascading style sheet nightmare where it's very easy to put in an override that you thought was scoped and actually is, is much broader than you, you initially expected. And this kind of leads to this steadily growing overhead of regression testing failures and rollbacks. And what that means is that doing the release becomes this real big old ordeal. You know, I've been to, I, I, in one of my previous organizations, it could take the best part of a day to, to release the front end. And this makes it really expensive to do so you don't do it very often. And when every release is a big deal, you don't do them very much and you stop shipping regular value to customers and your product can start to stagnate and your competitors who maybe are moving faster than you start to get the edge. Uh, so it kind of sucks. So now we use a combination of the serverless framework and drone CI to give us continuous deployment with just two commands. And we can do that on a, project by project basis. So we can make changes as many times as we want, whenever we need to, it's, it doesn't matter anymore. It's, it's really easy to do and it's really easy to roll back. There's no risk attached to it. So we just, just crack on. Fundamentally releases become lightning fast. We, the change is bounded within the application that's being released, which means regressions are much less likely and the impact of any defect is reduced. But micro front ends are not a perfect solution. So what I will do is, have we got any questions at the moment? Uh, nothing coming through yet. If you've got any uh, questions for Tom guys, just let me know. Uh, use the Q&A section, we'll get some questions through. Do you have a little tiny uh, break here? If there's no questions yet, I'll, um, I'll crack on. Yeah, feel free. Yeah, as, as I always say, micro front ends are not a perfect solution. So when deciding whether or not to implement this kind of technology, it's a good idea to consider some of the limitations or challenges you may face. Like most problems can be solved with enough time and effort, but you should also weigh up whether it's worth doing. You know, this will depend on general factors, but also specific to your organization, such as, you know, the skills that you have within your team, the stage that your business is at, and even like the culture around, you know, how you manage change and how comfortable you are with it. So what we can do is we can look at a few examples of the limitations that you might face while trying to implement something like this. So making updates across lots of services can get really repetitive and annoying. This is, this is just a fact of life. The more repos you have, the more places you have to look and you know, that can get a little bit tough. Not great. You can also end up with developers doing a lot of context switching between the different applications that they might be working on, especially in a smaller team where you're running micro front ends, but maybe you've not got that many developers and they're spinning a few plates. Um, this can be an issue particularly for your more junior developers who perhaps just really want to get their head down and focus on like doing one thing really, really well, which is kind of the point of microservices as well. Legacy hates the new kid. This, this can always be an absolute nightmare. Uh, whenever you start to build out something that's fundamentally different, you have to make sure it can still talk to the things that you've got in place. Um, you've got your monolith. How do you break it down in such a way that these new services can still communicate and work with it without too many problems? Um, that can be down to, you know, if you've got a classic MVC application, maybe, maybe it hasn't got any APIs exposed that you can use. So um, you've got to consider how you break stuff down. And finally, keeping track of everything like repos, infrastructure, etc. You know, the more stuff you have in the more places, you know, the tougher it's going to get to kind of hold all that down. And, and really, the big one is, you know, anything new has an implicit overhead. So we've got to think about limitations like that. But there's always, as I said, possible solutions. Wherever possible to avoid making lots of updates, centralize something one repo architecture to um, kind of reduce that kind of overhead of you know making lots of updates in lots of places 
but also remembering that you know sometimes updates in different places have inherently different things going on with them so it, it's always good to sort of not make everything completely shareable all the time if you want to deal with the kind of concept switching is issue to it to really helps so you know as a team we got together and we we started to define you know what shape should our projects be and what's the best way of doing linting and uh, maintaining a consistent style so that someone can jump in and it feels like home we're, our issue with legacy was that um, a lot of our old services uh, wouldn't speak to a client directly you kind of had to have a load of tokens which were um, something that we didn't really want to expose um, you know to the wide world so we just built some more microservices we put some tiny little lambda functions in front of um, our legacy code and just use them as proxies to talk between the two and that was great they, they were able to talk to both even though neither would talk to each other so we just we just um, incrementally shifted it out and then those microservices can start to take more responsibility over time I mean this one's a no-brainer you've got lots of stuff in any situation microservices aren't really going to change that too much it's all about maintaining documentation properly and clearly we use notion and we use you know quality readmes and really it's as simple as that tell someone what they need to do with the thing they're about to use but the most important thing to remember is that everything has an implicit overhead so always do your cost benefit analysis fundamentally we want to talk about this when introducing any new thing be it technological or, or process driven you should always test it against i think these two criteria does it solve a real problem that we have right now? And will its positive benefits outweigh any negative effects? If you've got these two, then time changes slides too quickly, then, then you're golden. I can see a few questions coming in now. So um, should, we, should we have a little answer of a few of those? Yeah, definitely. So we've got an anonymous person um, says, what are the downsides of microservices? I thought that it is always beneficial to build it like that instead of a monolith because it's easier for your code to grow. Microservices are fantastic, but you always have to look at like, what scale are you going to get to, what you need to do. I mean, if you need to, for example, run a POC of a business model and put software behind that, then spending months and months architecting, you know, the most beautiful set of services with re really clearly bounded context is not necessarily practical because, you know, you've got to look at your time to market and um, that, that's really key. Like if you spend too long I mean iron about how you do it you might have lost the chance to be the person doing it someone else can come up and jump on your back also microservices often come out of the understanding of what your domains are within a particular business so until you've really understood the context of your domains it can be pretty hard to actually break them down into things that are rational and logical so it's not so much that the microservices shouldn't be used ever it's about more looking at the right time within a particular product to start to think about doing it um, unless perhaps you're, you're looking at new products within an existing organization where you've got the structure in place and you kind of know what you're doing. But for, you know, some small situations, you know, a monolith can be perfectly fine and, and it can be enough. And it's more, it's more about just understanding that the benefits are around scale and autonomy. And if you're not having those problems, then the microservices, although still a fantastic way of delivering software, might just be overkill, you know, that kind of hammer to crack a walnut kind of situation. Brilliant. Um, another question comes through from Ahmet Atasoy, um, says, are you using learner slash yearn workspaces to put your things together? At the moment we are using, um, in terms of putting things together, I'm, I'm not quite sure. We, we use yarn as our build tool um, to run scripts. So, you know, within um, each project, we'll generally use yarn to kind of run stuff. But then in terms of uh, compiling our, our applications, um, Webpack is doing the compilation and then a framework called serverless um, for our front ends at least is what we're using to then take those application bundles and deploy them into well, AWS for us um, and we use drone CI to kind of work as our build runner as our continuous integration uh, project for that. Perfect. Okay. We're not using workspaces as such. Um, another anonymous question comes through as well. Um, would you ever have more than one micro front end on the screen at the same time? And can you communicate between them? Yeah, that, that's actually that's a really cool question. So we've gone for an architecture where we're using hyperlinked applications, which means that one application is essentially a user journey. Um, and that's kind of one of the simplest uh, versions that you'll get. 
uh, in terms of that. But if you, if you want to read more into it, um, another great architectural option, if, if you've got a more complex application where maybe, I know you're an e-commerce platform, you want to have your shopping bag in one place and then you've got, you know, uh, a list of products in another place, um, you can start to look at um, composite UIs where you can do various different things such as uh, server-side compilation or even using um, kind of custom HTML components to essentially attach multiple applications to uh, the same interface sort of configured perhaps by a piece of HTML. So as I said, you can have like a shopping bag as, as one application, which is essentially a micro front end. And then, you know, your listing page of, of your little products you might want to buy as, a, as another front end um, and then just compose them with the HTML. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's an interesting concept. It's, it's um, certainly not one that you might need to go to straight away, but, you know, it is something that could work really well. Perfect. Okay, we'll do one more question and then we'll move on to the next part of the, uh, the presentation. So Piotr Lewandowski has asked, um, are there any specific types of projects where microservices would work best? Yeah, I think um, microservices work best when you, you have a, a kind of a need to perhaps split things out and um, understand them in small areas. So there's kind of two reasons why you might want to do that. The first one is that you've, you've got either a really broad project where there's lots of things going on now, for example, you're running a service such as, I don't know, you want to do a webinar tool where people can ask questions and they can, you know, sign up and register and they can log in and they can control their camera or something like, you know, this Zoom call. You know, each of those things could really easily become its own service and each of those things have really kind of different sets of requirements. So it's a really great time to start breaking them up into separate entities which different teams can deliver. Another great example of, of a really successful use of microservices is actually Spotify. If you actually go into the Spotify web application or even the app on your phone, I presume, um, you can see there's lots of things going on in that, which are different jobs. So you've got your list of music, you've got the little bit where you can see what your, your mates are listening to, and each of those are completely different data streams. So they, they've obviously looked at time and gone, well, our product is made up of lots of different things and we can get a different team to own them and run them. And the other reason is obviously that rather than the technical side, it's like if you've got lots of teams working on different things and they will have to then come together to release code into a single code base, these people might only talk once a month and it can get real, real messy. So that's another great indicator that maybe you want to start this as a, as a service in its own right, because you want a team to be able to work quickly and well. Perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, feel free to carry on with the rest of the presentation. We've got a couple of questions coming through as well, but we can, uh, we can answer them in a couple of moments. Perfect. Cool. So the last thing I want to talk to you about a little bit is a couple of the things that we kind of learned the hard way. So you might not have to, because obviously whenever you do something new or you're starting to move into an area, which is a little bit unknown, you're going to learn some things and you're probably going to learn them out by failing, which is kind of nice. You know, you learn more from it, but you don't always have to fail if someone's already failed first. So the first one I'll talk about is persistence across boundaries. Um, at least with us, micro, our micro front ends are separate by design. The apps are entirely client side, state is not shared between them and the context can be lost between boundaries. You know, so a simple way to implement them would be just, as I said, on completely separate domains collected by hyperlinks, that's what we've done. But the downside of this is that each app has no idea about the other in any way and the user is usually one who will suffer in this case because um, well, in our case, the big problem was authentication. Um, when we first started to split applications off from our monolith, uh, we really, really sucked at making authentication a great experience. And in our first app, what we tried to do was just kind of replicate user sessions uh, from the global context. But the problem with replication is it's really easy to come out of sync and you find that a user was logged in somewhere they weren't expecting to be or not logged in when they should have been. And, and often and there was even the potential of getting into a cycle where you constantly try to log in and never could. And as we iterated, we went, well, maybe we just need separate logins. But that was also a rubbish experience because, um, you know, we made the users repeat themselves a lot. And that's just stupid, right? If, if they're in Headbox, they should just be in Headbox. They shouldn't have to be logging in every time they have a slightly different experience. Um, so what we uh, devised was the, a method of using a uh, session key stored as a cookie. Um, actually, it was a HTTP only cookie, which, which provided global context. And we, we held that on our top level Headbox domain so that anything on a subdomain of Headbox would, would have access to that. And with that token, we could just proxy, or we could send that token to uh, a small microservice, which would return us back a JSON web token. 
and that JSON Web Token became this kind of key to persist the global user context um, and also allow any front end to communicate with any API that have permissions to do so. So, you know, finding a way to solve that inability to directly communicate between applications was, was really interesting, but it could also come within, you know, set storing various session states within a React application, as we know, you know, state is inherently held in memory and you'd have to kind of write it somewhere, which everyone else has access to. So, you know, we use JWT to store a lot of that and persist a lot of that. And it was, it was kind of a nice, nice solve. Another one, which is really important to talk about is whenever you're looking at kind of cutting edge software and cutting edge technology, you've got to think to yourself, are your customers as cutting edge as you? It's something which used to be limited to kind of going, oh, you know, what version of IE might we support? More often now, it's also thinking about maybe the device type or even, you know, what kind of uh, data usage are they on? Are they, are they going to be able to kind of handle up the amount of information that we need to put through, through, their, through their client? But people don't often think about this. And this is really interesting because um, we started to get calls occasionally, initially just from one user about they weren't ac able to access our service. And uh, over time, it wasn't just one company, you know, we were starting to get a few more come out of the woodwork. And um, it turned out that what was happening with the corporate IT systems that sort of sat around quite a lot of our users, because we were predominantly B2B, was that they were stripping out a load of um, our course headers. And uh, this was causing our credential request to fail. So our services couldn't talk to each other properly. Um, luckily, it was a relatively easy fix. But for me, it really highlights that you need to kind of holistically understand your customer's context before kind of jumping forward. You know, and if your product is B2B, you're going to have to navigate that kind of insanity, which is the corporate ID department. You know, we've got users who are basically sat in front of a machine, which has got so much kind of security and governance on it that a Casio calculator has got more processing power left on it and more ability to do stuff. So, um, yeah, limited access to technology is, is um, a really important thing to consider. And the final thing that I thought I'd share with you is actually what we use as our stack, because um, probably a question that you're going to ask anyway. So at Headbox right now, we are producing a static application bundle using React and TypeScript. This is essentially each of our web apps. We then use templated HTML to create a deployable conf configuration. So the application bundle is static and versioned and what we call immutable. And the HTML file creates a configuration which says which version of the application it should be showing in production or at any other stage in the life cycle. We then handle requests for our software using edge cache lambda functions uh, written in Node.js and TypeScript. So it's literally just um, you know, statically serving a website, so statically serving that HTML config. And then we, we run a CI CD uh, system using serverless framework and drone, which is, as I said before, you know, two commands and, and off the code goes. And um, this is all based on the principles and architecture of immutable web apps, which you can look up very closely coupled and, and kind of similar methodology and mindset to Jamstack, if, if anyone's uh, taken a look into that, which is a really great kind of uh, progressive uh, methodology. And our architecture looks a little bit like this. So we uh, run our source control into an S3 bucket, which carries our static version assets. And then we also use the AWS parameter store to um, staged, to kind of hold this staged application configuration. And then AWS Edge is really great. so that allows us to have super, super fast, super highly cached and highly available applications wherever our customers are. And um, yeah, straight through to the browser. So I'll leave that diagram up and um, let's take any more questions that we might have. Perfect, okay. So we've got a question from Jason. So he's just asked if you can talk a little bit more about how you share code between microservices, anything such as business logic components and styles. Cool, great question. So we, we do a few things. Um, we have, uh, for our kind of core branded styling, we, we created a small NPM repository, which allows us to share kind of style components such as logos, uh, basic color sets, um, little, little things like that, fonts. Um, we're actually using a, a component system to allow us to do some of that. So um, that's kind of our, our kind of projection of that. And so people can just install that and, and consume a century health set of kind of branded styling. In terms of sharing wider stuff, one of the big things at the moment we're, we're looking at doing is, is understanding the best way to do that. Um, our applications are super small and super specific, which means that right now there hasn't been a lot of crossover in functionality. Um, I'm actually quite a 
strong believer that if you try and centralize and share stuff too much, you end up with these kind of want, you might have once had this beautiful Jaguar, but you're now in the Mad Max world where it's rusty and there's loads of weird stuff hanging off in it doesn't really work as well as it did for any of the jobs. So sometimes the best option is simply copy and paste and then make the unique change you might need for that context. So we are doing some POCs into mono repositories and the ability to share code a little bit more, but right now we haven't had a problem where we felt that sharing code, you know, in, in a kind of more programmatic way was, was um, super, super important. Perfect. Okay. Uh, another anonymous question. Um, when starting a new project, what are the key indicators that a microservice front end is the right approach? For us, it was looking at, you know, why are we, why are we building lots of logic for lots of different people um, into the same application when these things are completely standalone and completely separate. So with the lead feed, which is the first place we really, really uh, proved out microservices, we said, well, we've got three users. They, 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 their roles never touch. You are one or your, you only have one of those users. So we use that as a great line of demarcation. Um, in terms of breaking up a monolithic front end, you know, there's, there's a really great um, technique called the strangle pattern where when you want to rewrite a particular facet, maybe you, I don't know, you want to rewrite your, your login. Maybe that's a good time to break a small chunk off of your monolith and uh, make that into its own service, integrate it back with your monolith and, and start to move forward from there. I wouldn't really recommend in most cases doing a, a wholesale refactor to microservices, either front end or back end in one go. You know, you'll end up in that kind of replatform scenario where you might spend two i don't know two years just kind of on a large code base trying to break it back down again without any real value and a lot of money spent so yeah breaking things down in stages as as the kind of business needs arise is probably my recommendation perfect uh, another question from husney um how does seo work within micro front ends great question so um we don't have any SEO requirements for our micro front ends, which are working as immutable applications because they are kind of user services, which are things that people need to log into um, kind of access as, as part of a, a service. Um, we have actually just recently launched a new product, which is or a new area of our product, which is a new set of landing pages. Um, so in terms of SEO for that, we were able to be technology agnostic. We didn't just have to use immutable applications and, and react. So, uh, we actually, for that, used the, the Next.js uh, server-side rendering um, capabilities to, to run those. So basically, all of our landing pages now are going to be deployed by a Next.js application, which has uh, server-side rendering and therefore is able to work as a, as a full kind of SEO-compliant application. We actually also uh, used, rather than kind of pure React, we used uh, Google AMP components, which are super, super optimized for SEO, fast load times and stuff like that. Brilliant. Okay. Um, a question from Luca Tardito. Um, what about end-to-end -end testing? Does it change something with the microservices? That's an interesting one. It depends on the strategy you go for. Um, we're a relatively small startup, so we still do a lot of our end-to-end -end testing manually, to be honest. So um, we, we use communication uh, verbally and through uh, really well-written user stories with, with clear journeys mapped out. End-to-end um, -end testing on a large scale through microservices really becomes a little bit more of an input-output game. So often, you know, you, you can look at using kind of integration tests to make sure everything, you know, talks to each other properly. And then fundamentally, you, you can start to write tests that say, did, did a particular journey happen? Um, there's various options for that. I've worked with Nightwatch before. We've played around with various things. There's a great uh, library called CodeSet, which can do quite good jobs of that. But then really what you want to do is you want to see, did it, you know, do it from a user perspective and say, you know, given a particular user role, can they perform the action they expect to do? And if it fails, you know, you then need to look at where in the chain that might happen. Perfect. Okay. Um, one more question as well from Andres. Um, could you use something like storybook component to share components between microservices? Would this help keep styling in place? You certainly could. I mean, there's loads of ways of doing it. If, if you start to produce storybooks, obviously someone can pick that piece of code up and move it somewhere else really easily. So it's, it's a perfectly good option to use. Um, what we found is one of the most important things for sharing is, is rather than worrying too much about kind of sharing focused solutions entirely, it's also about how you architect your project. So we really encourage creating very modular component structures within, um, you know, the projects themselves. So rather than having all of the stuff you're going to do, just sort of banged in three, eight big old, um, you know, JSX files, if it's React or TSX files, if it's TypeScript, React, you know, we, we like to sort of say, 
well, let's break things down into small little nuggets, which is usually, you know, say you have a button, you'll have your directory for a button, you'll have your JSX file containing your, your React code for your button, and then probably a test to validate that that button works at a unit level. And then if someone says, hey, can I grab that button? You can just send them that small directory or, or you can pick it up from another project and move it in, in quite a kind of discrete manner. So I think that's one of the biggest things for shareability is actually creating really well-bounded sets of components and, and really discrete pieces of functionality which don't kind of get mashed up in the rest of your code base too, too much. Brilliant, okay. Um, Lucas, so thank you for that. Um, that's the end of the questions for now. Um, if anyone has got another question for Tom, um, feel free to get it in over the next sort of 30 seconds or so. Um, but in the meantime, obviously, I want to thank, thank Tom for obviously giving this, uh, this talk. Um, I think it's been really good, really helpful, hopefully for people that have been uh, attending. So. Um, in terms of our webinars um, and things like that moving forward, we do have a number coming up across JavaScript, Python and Golang as well. Um, so if anyone wants to rewatch this tomorrow or pass it on to any friends that haven't been able to make it today, I will be doing a LinkedIn post tomorrow where all the YouTube links, um, you can watch it again there if that's something you're interested in. Um, another thing as well, if you've seen what Tom's doing, it's giving you a little bit of inspiration, um, feel free to drop me a message or, or give me a call if you want to host something like this in the future. Um, I think it's a really good way to build your own personal brand and obviously like Tom's done today, give us a bit of a talk on how Headbox run their own sort of microservices. So um, I've not had any more questions come through. So um, I think that's everything for now. But yeah, thank you very much, Tom. Really appreciate you taking your time out to um, give this chat today. Much appreciated. No Great fun. Thank you so much. No problem at all. Right. See everyone soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you later.